So we've heard a lot of amazing uh, stories and information tonight about the various ways that we can lose cultural heritage to looting, but we haven't really talked about losing cultural heritage to armed conflict and the kind of looting that basically just happens when you have uh, an entire nation like Nazi Germany kind of devoted to looting on the most massive scale in history. And there was a recent movie called The Monuments Men that kind of, um, in a fictionalized way, devoted itself to talking about the Monuments Men. And these were really my heroes um, when I was in grad school studying art history and also serving as a young military officer. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I would love to save art as part of my military career. There were fewer than 350 Monuments men altogether, most of them were in the US military, a small handful of them were um, from the British military and then the other allied forces. And, and think of this in a conflict of over a billion people throughout World War II. While we have this amazing story of the Monuments Men, uh, not a lot of people remembered it and I think that the movie really brought to bear um, this awareness about cultural property during armed conflict and, and the risk that it takes. Yes, of course, um, people are um, killed and people are displaced on a massive scale, but what happens to their identity, to their cultural heritage? And how did the Nazi looting of millions of objects, and, and particularly from um, European museums and Jewish collections where um, people were targeted specifically because of their collections like the Rothschild family, et cetera. You know, how, how do you combat that? And so we had this small group of people dedicated to this. This is James Rohrmer who uh, was a serving military and infantry officer. And, and basically most of the Monuments Men were already actively serving in the military and the cultural heritage professional community, the museum's community, essentially told the military where to find these folks within the ranks who had this kind of capability. James Romer was a curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They brought him out of the infantry and over to the Monuments Men, and they worked kind of all across Europe. First of all, preventing or trying to prevent through mapping, by providing maps to the military to keep them from hitting sites with bombing. But then later, as they discovered the looted material that the Nazis were, was, were keeping around in Austria and Germany, finding that material, figuring out a way to repatriate it to its country of origin so it could be returned to its uh, rightful owners. So we learned a big lesson from that and uh, the countries of the world got together and decided to create a new international treaty, the 1954 Hague Convention, to specifically to protect cultural heritage during armed conflict. But that doesn't mean that it necessarily worked. You can make treaties, but a lot of times uh, the countries involved in conflicts don't necessarily adhere to them. So we had terrible situations like the intentional uh, targeting of cultural heritage in the Bosnia conflict. We had the uh, deliberate destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas by the Taliban. And I think most of us remember the 2003 looting of the Iraq Museum. Um, it was very much in the media that everything from the museum was completely gone. That actually turned out not to be true. Um, the museum staff hid many of those collections or most of the collections in a secret storage location. The real saviors of cultural heritage in these terrible situations of disaster and armed conflict and looting are the people who take care of it every day. Those curators, those um, museum directors who often risk their lives to do this. And this was the same case in the Iraq Museum. But they did indeed lose more than 15,000 objects for the collection, that's an estimate. Documentation, very important. You don't know what's been looted from your museum if it hasn't properly been cataloged and photographed to begin with. 
Unfortunately, that was the case with the Iraq Museum. Under the 10 years of sanctions, they hadn't really been able to take the time to document excavation material that was coming into the museum. It kind of got boxed and put in storage, and that was the first place the looters went, was to the storage areas. They couldn't hide everything. Many, many storage magazines, over a million objects were in this museum when it was looted. And unfortunately, many of the regional museums had stored their collections in Baghdad for safekeeping, which turned out to be not so safe. You'd think that there's an international uh, group, sort of a uh, cultural heritage rescue squad that parachutes in after an incident like this. And that's what I thought. Um, I was a very naive uh, major um, who was assigned to go to Baghdad to help with the museum and to help advise the Ministry of Culture as an art historian and museum curator myself and suddenly realized that we had a much larger scale problem than just the museum looting. We had looting of archaeological sites throughout the country. Um, you know, under Saddam Hussein, death was the penalty for looting if you got caught. But, you know, suddenly here was a really unstable situation with um, looting happening in the city of Baghdad. So uh, it wasn't very easy to go out to the countryside and protect archaeological sites. And so here's the extent of the monuments men for <laughs> Baghdad in 2003. And one of them was a woman. There were monuments women in World War II as well. But um, so my colleague, uh, Wes Sumner there, Captain Wes Sumner at the time, was uh, a landscape archaeologist. And so he, he preceded me in Baghdad. And uh, you know when I arrived after the looting, I, I was called up as an individual and went straight to Baghdad. And he said, wow, OK, good luck with this. <laughs> because I'm going to go save the National Zoo now. And that's exactly what he proceeded to do. And he wrote a wonderful book about it. Um, so, But I just want to point out that we're at the uh, Central Bank of Iraq in this photo in Baghdad. And we're here because a wonderful collection of archaeological artifacts from the site at Nimrud, uh, um, often referred to as the treasure of Nimrud, which is uh, very important, probably next to King Tut's treasure and the Bactrian Horde, probably the third most important um, treasure of the like. And uh, National Geographic was very, very uh, worried about the status of this collection and um, had representatives there on the ground. They had a project where they actually paid to uh, pump water out of the basement of the Iraq National Museum. And why the military hadn't figured out how to do this yet, I still don't have a clue. But, um, and it had to be done more than once, because they were having a hard time finding out where the water was coming in. But finally, they were able to do so. And I, you know, get, 10 years later, I just want to thank my colleagues at National Geographic for contributing to that and allowing us to safeguard this really important cultural resource. Um, so coming back. And realizing that there really isn't uh, an organization who does this kind of cultural heritage rescue, like on the ground, immediate response, kind of like Doctors Without Borders does for people, I r really realized that there is not that kind of museum for culture. We have UNESCO, which is a really important organization that does major cultural heritage preservation projects, but I'm talking about real have a bag packed by your door and have all your shots and go and help your colleagues in a disastrous situation like this. So um, we created the US Committee of the Blue Shield. It's a nonprofit organization that's part of an international network to do this kind of, or to support this kind of work, but it's still very difficult. And I'll talk about you know, some of the ongoing challenges of trying to do this kind of work internationally. I don't think I have to go too far into the problems with Egyptian sites, but I have to say it felt a little bit uh, deja vu seeing images of uh, in a major archaeological museum in a country where there was horrible instability and seeing images of soldiers inside the National Museum in Egypt, a, a place that I'd only gotten an opportunity to visit once, and you know, worried very much about what was going to happen with the sites. Another major area where we've seen intentional destruction of cultural heritage recently, you heard about the jihadist groups who occupied northern Mali 
And finally, in January of 2012, they were driven out by French forces, but not before they did a tremendous amount of damage to uh, the cultural heritage of the region, and particularly the historic city of Timbuktu where they damaged, um, they burned many of the manuscript collections of the Ahmed Baba Library. They looted museums, as you can see there. Um, they destroyed the Sufi uh, saints' mausoleums around the city of Timbuktu. And they also, um, in a really insidious way, prevented Malians from practicing their very important intangible heritage. No singing no traditional dress. Women were not allowed to wear their hair the way they wanted to. Men were required to dress in a certain way, and they weren't allowed to have dance, poetry, or theater. So these things uh, for Malians you know, were, were almost as damaged, damaging to their culture as seeing the objects destroyed. And then finally, the really terrible scenario that we're experiencing now with the Syrian civil war, this is the ancient Sukh in Aleppo. This is just one example of the many, many tragic cases. The um, city of Aleppo is a World Heritage Site, and it has been pretty much devastated during the conflict. The um, Grand Mosque has been uh, grievously damaged. That whole central ancient part of the city damaged. Um, Crack de Chevalier, the Crusader Fortress, another World Heritage Site, very much devastated from being used as a military base of operations and the fighting going on between the two sides. Those are just a few examples. So what can we do about it? Resources, well, where I work, the Smithsonian, uh, a few years ago recognized that there is a need for this type of response. And with our resources that we have, 19 museums, nine research centers, a zoo, um, and more than 6,000 colleagues that I can call upon for their time and their expertise, um, it's, it's become really clear that through partnerships, a uh, sort of whole of government approach, talking with organizations within government like the Department of State, USAID, the Department of Defense, that we can have a lot of effect. And then partnering with non-governmental organizations and uh, nonprofits like National Geographic, like the Blue Shield, like the International Council of Museums, et cetera, that we can have an effect. Um, so in order to help with this uh, dearth of modern day monuments, men as we like to say, um, the Blue Shield instituted a program of training US military forces about cultural property protection, specifically civil affairs units. The World War II monuments men were civil affairs, and they still are today. This is a very recent one, just a couple of weeks ago. We had Marines from the Civil Military Operations School at Quantico at the National Portrait Gallery and American Art Museum training on packing and crating in emergency situations. Um, the Haiti project was a big area um, where Smithsonian really recognized the need to jump in and help with cultural recovery. During that, we partnered with a number of organizations, including the American Institute for Conservation, which is based here in DC. Um, the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities helped us get it kicked off with Michelle Obama's involvement. And we were able to um, help our Haitian colleagues save more than 30,000 objects of their heritage over an 18-month project. Here are the Holy Trinity murals that were saved, and these are being stored until they can build a new church. We have a museum professional training program at the Smithsonian, which works around the world. But in particular, recently, we went to Mali to help train their museum professionals, plus professionals from eight other West African countries on disaster risk management, thinking about using museums for post-conflict recon reconciliation and other programs to really help museum professionals think about that what if scenario. What if this could happen to my museum? Or if it already has, sharing information about how you were able to save your collections. We hope to be able to serve as a point of coordination for multiple partnerships to help be that emergency responder for cultural heritage, to help our colleagues who are under duress from natural disasters and armed conflicts to save their collections and to train about documentation and international legal instruments that can help worldwide in saving our cultural heritage. Thanks a lot.